Welcome to this uh, session on Central Eastern Europe in reshuffle, a region in reshuffle. Um, allow me to say a few words before I turn to the panel. Um, I'd like to open with recalling us how the management of what some have started calling a PERMA crisis, and I won't list them all, but basically I'm going back to the financial economic crisis, um, how throughout the management of these crises we have seen joint solutions coming about in the EU and have been occasionally quite surprised by them. Uh, we have seen deepening of the integration, but at the same time we have also seen growing differences between the member states. It's only natural. Um, with regard to the choices, of course, on how to solve the crisis and the directions that have been taken. At the same time, as part of strategy, we have also seen formation of groupings, like-minded groups, if you wish, more or less institutionalized, uh, working closely on particular issues or more broadly, informing each other, cooperating, coordinating, searching support. Now, the Visegrad 4 format, which is in principle the subject of today's discussion, uh, has not been forged in any of these latest crises. Uh, we've been reminded by Jim Claus earlier that its origins go to 1335 Visegrad Summit, if I recall correctly, but we're going to focus on its revived origins in 1991. I think it's enough for the late hour. Um, with the four countries sought to, in 1991, seeking to strengthen security and stability in the region, and at the same time, support for each other in their approximation to EU and NATO. Um, now, some of the recent crises and directions taken by the EU have exposed occasional and perhaps deeper rifts. There have been, some have been addressed already in the course of this afternoon, between the Central and Eastern European countries, or V4 in particular. So this session is dedicated to the exploration of these rifts and to the prospects of cooperation on existing and upcoming initiatives and challenges. Uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, EU's competencies in health and energy policies, climate-related legislation, future of the EU, and future of the democracy, both at the EU level and in the member states, are only some of the subjects we will explore in the next, I believe, 18 minutes or so, with my stellar panel. And I would like to thank the organizers for putting the panel together and for putting me, Sabina Lange, in charge of the moderation. I come from the European Institute of Public Administration in Maastricht, but uh, this morning I recalled that I was here in this very room, Sal, um, in 2008 as a representative of the Center of International Relations from Ljubljana, which makes me some kind of a dinosaur of uh, EFSA PPCs. But moving on. Joining us online is Professor Peter Balas. Professor Balas, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, Professor Balas is the Professor Emeritus of the Central Eastern European University um, in Budapest, and perhaps more better known among us as a former Hungarian foreign minister until 2010 and former member of the European Commission. To my further left is Ambassador Vasaryovas, Vasharyova, whose diverse careers include ambassadorial posts in the region. And I believe uh, you were also instrumental in setting up the Slovak Foreign Policy Association, I was told by friends who uh, fed me in on this. Um, Dr. Cikotsky is a political historian specializing in Polish and German relations, and he's also a program director of the Natalin European Center and has worked as a citizen advisor to President Lech Kaczynski, if I'm correct. Now, we agreed to start with short and sharp introductory remarks in the presented order, followed by a short panel discussion among us to deepen and also question and, and share perspectives before then opening the floor uh, to you. Now, let me start with Professor uh, Balas. Um, now, uh, Jim Claus, as I said before, uh, whom you probably remember uh, as the chef de cabinet of the president of the commission some moons ago, and later deputy director general in the council, as I believe at the time when you were foreign minister, reminded us earlier of that 1335 Visegrad summit, 
Um, but I would like to ask you to chart out the importance of the CE cooperation, and in particular of the V4, since the revival in 1991, and your views on the prospects in, the view, in view of the current developments, and in particular the situation or the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Thank you, Mrs. Lange. It's good to see you on the screen. Uh, let me uh, organize my uh, short introduction around uh, three points. First, uh, answering your question about uh, the V4, the role of the V4. Second, a few words about Russia. And uh, last but not least, about uh, the role of Hungary. Uh, the first uh, part is um, something about the pioneers of yesterday, because the Visegrad nations, uh, uh, the four nations in the three countries by then, were the pioneers uh, of the opening to the West. Uh, Poland and Hungary gave the name to the FAR program. Uh, then the three states approached OECD uh, as early as 1990. Uh, Poland and Hungary applied first for EU membership in 94. The uh, two countries with the Czech Republic approached NATO uh, successfully uh, and so on. There was an exceptional uh, constellation uh, in um, uh, the conditions, uh, mainly on three pillars. The first was that the great majority of our populations supported the Western modernization after decades of the Soviet model. The second was that the Western organizations were uh, open. They were waiting for the applicants with open arms and that they even encouraged uh, the, uh, the applicants uh, to progress. And the third uh, is that no major third player opposed the enlargement of EU and NATO, first of all, Russia didn't act against uh, that enlargement. What is the situation 20 years later? 20 years later is uh, partly a generation change, but uh, a very sharp political turn uh, in these countries. Uh, many people uh, are disappointed or were disappointed, first of all, with the systemic change, but that they projected that disappointment to the EU as well. They expected a very quick uh, increase of the living standard, uh, which did not happen immediately. And the uh, losers uh, of the systemic change uh, have been uh, more than, than, than winners. And that situation has encouraged uh, uh, anti-elite, anti-establishment populist politics in several countries. The, the conservative extreme right uh, came to power. At the same time, the EU satisfied with formal legal institutional adaptation to the rules and did not monitor in depth the implementation of those rules, did not track the use, the proper use of EU funds, and uh, did not sanction uh, deviations or breakings of the EU uh, out of the, uh, the very soft uh, infringement uh, procedures. And third, uh, Russia turned against the West, conducting a hybrid war, tearing apart smaller territories from post-Soviet states, uh, fake news, uh, uh, and uh, uh, an escalation. Now, uh, as I promised a few words about uh, Russia, I think the origin of the problem is that uh, the Soviet Union has lost the Cold War. Uh, it, uh, it's a, 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 an obvious uh, outcome, uh, but the post-war status quo has not been defined in a peace treaty. So it, it was a, a, a special end of a conflict situation where the, the new status quo is not defined uh, in an internationally accepted document. The West uh, tried to make the maximum benefits from it by the expansion and enlargement of both EU and NATO. Those organizations could double uh, their membership. 
At the same time, uh, nobody really analyzed this very complex situation from three different elements. One was the systemic change in itself in uh, all these countries. The second was changing the alliances, going over from the Warsaw Pact to NATO, from Comecon uh, to the EU. And third, the, uh, the birth of many new states. Three federal states were falling apart, Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and uh, Czechoslovakia, putting 24 new states on the map with new uh, national economies, new identities, and so on. Not everybody recognized the former administration units as new states. Uh, Post-Yugoslav wars uh, broke out, but NATO intervened uh, for taming Serbian revanches. In the post-Soviet area, uh, initially there was seemingly peace and the small scale Russian expansion, uh, tearing apart pieces like Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, did not provoke uh, uh, serious reactions uh, from the outside world. Uh, they more or less accepted the frozen conflicts. Crimea uh, has provoked more tension, and now uh, the escalation went as far as the open armed uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, to close, um, the, uh, the V4 and Hungary in the V4. Uh, we were very happy when the V4 was created, many of us, including myself, uh, uh, in February 1991. But uh, uh, the basic document of that organization is nothing more than a declaration of political intentions. V4 is under institutionalized and under regulated uh, measure to its real importance. There are no formal obligations. There is no treaty. Uh, there is a rotating presidency and very loose uh, uh, cooperation. A typical intergovernmental organization where the input depends always on the governments. And we could see ups and downs in, in the history of V4, depending on who is for and who is not so much for cooperation. We had a, a very good cooperation in the EU Council uh, in the time by, when I was in the government and uh, uh, I think uh, Donald Tusk and Gordon Bainai as prime ministers uh, were uh, dynamizing the V4. And then came another model uh, in the last years, the Polish-Hungarian threat of veto, uh, the orban Morawiecki threat, uh, of vetoing the EU budget because of, of rule of law conditionality. And we have come to, to the end of that couple because on Ukraine, the two governments do not agree. And uh, for the moment, uh, V4 is Hungary plus three. Uh, there are serious discussions on the, the sixth package of sanctions on Russia, uh, the Hungarian uh, threat with veto, and the very uh, uh, last declarations of Katarina Barley from the European Parliament or Robert Habeck, the vice chancellor of Germany, that uh, if Hungary resists, the other 26 should act uh, uh, together. Uh, these are the last news. Uh, I think that Orban has uh, increased uh, his uh, uh, demands, uh, but increased the, the, the danger of losing. And um, uh, I think uh, the, the, there is a fundamental difference as well concerning the future of EU. Maybe later we can speak about that issue as well. Uh, because uh, Hungary has not signed that letter, what uh, 13 uh, states uh, have addressed. The letter is about deepening the EU and the very clear position of the newly re-elected Hungarian government is loosening the EU, decreasing the competencies of the Union. I think I would stop here and looking forward uh, to uh, various reactions. Thank you.
Thank you very much. We decided to move on and then have a discussion between the panel. Uh, Ambassador Vasaryova, you, I believe, witnessed the beginnings of the Visegrad 4 format. Um, and we heard earlier today that perhaps the original objectives of strengthening the Central and Eastern European identity are slowly or perhaps faster giving way uh, to other objectives. Um, Professor Balas just noted that it very much depends on who is in charge, on the government in place. Um, but on the other hand, we have that declaration which talks very much about the identity, and this is also repeated in the 2004 declaration, strengthening the cooperation then once the objective of joining the EU and NATO has been achieved. My question to you would be, where are the foundations of the V4 cooperation if they are changing now from this identity cooperation? Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to come again to form a, my ministry as a as a federal Czechoslovakia. I was one of the uh, one of non-communist ambassadors of Czechoslovakia. Third one, yes, being sent to Vienna. Uh, uh, so I I feel myself comfortably here. Uh, Yes, I am. I am also one of the few witnesses uh, from the from the first ideas about the about the how these four nations, I would say, uh, not states but nations, how they are able co to cooperate uh, to to go uh, to the to the EU to NATO or or uh, to to not to not to provoke um, uh, some problems among us. Uh, please uh, be aware that uh, these four nations, uh, after the, the after the dissolution of monarchy, they uh, practically didn't find until now over the identity. There is no Central European uh, strong identity, according to me. So uh, we we waged uh, wars between ourselves uh, in these in these they, uh, let's say 20 years after the uh, big war, after the first war. Uh, if you see the textbooks of these four nations. Uh, you will see how differently we see our our history of uh, how we are uh, how we are not able to to speak one voice. So uh, uh, that's why uh, behind the idea of Václav Havel, uh, how to bring these four nations together uh, to to achieve some goals. Uh, these four nations, they've never had a proper dialogue uh, together before. Uh, at least uh, these hundred years after the dissolution of monarchy. Uh, for example, Magyars and Poland was strictly against the, the, the Czechoslovakia during the peace conference, peace conference in Versailles, 1921, strictly against. Yes, um, uh, we were then together in the grip of the Red Empire together, but we didn't have the opportunity to communicate openly with each other. So uh, V4, uh, the, that was the. V3 and then V4 after the dissolution of Czechoslovakia. However, uh, uh, we were we were prepared. Of, uh, our government were prepared to cooperate. How to push back the Soviet soldiers from our territory, and it was uh, really a big success. Uh, I remember that uh, at the early 1990, such an idea was a really revolutionary idea 
to be out of all this, uh, for example, in Czechoslovakia, 150,000 soldiers plus fam families here on the territory. So uh, I am speaking about that not to, not to uh, remember, please, these problems we, we, we solved during these last 30 years. Uh, after V4 was established, first of all in Bratislava, uh, it was meant by Václav Havel to let Bratislava uh, to have something very important. But then came, uh, then came uh, Hunger, uh, Magyars with, uh, with the idea that we have Visegrad. Visegrad, a place where uh, some hundred years ago, uh, three, three kings or, or emperors came together to speak first time. So, uh, and that was, it was really a, a big symbol. And this is the symbol we have to speak about it, yes? To come together, to, uh, to let speak together, uh, probably also cooperate if we are able to do it and uh, then to, uh, to maintain the peace among us. So these are three uh, big aims until today, why we are speaking together. Um, the Havel's idea was, uh, because I, I spoke with him many times um, in, early, in uh, the late 90s about this idea, so was based on the belief that we would not, we would not have any, uh, we would not have uh, any other neighbors. My God, so we were able to be very good neighbors with Ireland. But please, so we have we have only these neighbors. So we have to solve our problem in the framework with our neighbors, and. Uh, we must try to cultivate the coexistence in the space of Central Europe because, please, uh, we think um, that the Central Europe is a peaceful uh, um, place of Europe. We are uh, all the time of, um, victims of the bigs around us and so on. I think that Central Europe is a very dangerous place. And we will see it in the last hundred years. Yes, first of all, of, uh, the Hitler's invasion, then the Soviet invasion, and now we are trying to find something stable um, under our feet. Uh, the second point. The Czech Republic will take now the presidency, and the Slovak Republic, um, uh, in turn, is presiding the V4 in uh, a month, yes, and then also Slavkovsky format, so Austerlitz format, yes. So we spoke many times now the last six months what will, what, what will happen or how we will handle these presidencies to, uh, to, be, to, to push some problems forward or to solve some, some uh, ten tensions among, not only among us, but also in the whole Europe. Uh, we certainly won't be able today to reach consensus unless our neighbors are not interested in it. So it's clear. Uh, but we certainly won't seek to abolish V4 after these 30 years. That would be, according to me, unreasonable and very short-sighted idea. We have already experienced in these last 30 years sorts of misunderstandings and political escapades. Um, um, my friend Mr. Balash spoke about a little bit about it. For example, four years of Mečiar's government in Slovakia. Then 
uh, Orban's rejection of V4 in, in the years 2002-2004. Then threats from Mr. Zeman, he wanted to take your country, Slovenia, into V4, uh, immediately in now. Uh, then Orban's appearance abroad on behalf of whole V4 without uh, having a mandate to speak in a, in a, for, for the whole V4. Uh, perhaps this situation would help us to return to the roots of the cooperation at Bratislava Castle, 1991. Declaration which still contains strong signals and many hidden meanings are you able to find behind this. Uh, we are also, for example, awaiting a decision on the form and content of support for the projects of International Visegrad Fund, which is a really a tool we have in our hands and which is a good tool for the useful cooperation, especially for NGOs, very active NGOs in our countries. Um, my third point would be uh, uh, about the topic we are speaking all the time here, um, about the unprecedented occupation of uh, the Russian Federation in Ukraine. Uh, uh, as uh, we are um, uh, immediately neighbors for Ukraine, and uh, to deal with the subvisions and to try to communicate as important partners of this hard-pressed country where Ukraine soldiers are also fighting for our democratic future, for the democratic future of the Central Europe. And we have to be aware of it. Of, uh, the situation requires uh, from us to make some sacrifices, but a realistic assessment of the situation. And about all, no more naivety. No more naivety and incompetence. incompetence. Uh, Slovakia's task is to persuade at least the Czechs, at least the Czechs, to join Eurozone. Why? Because the Eurozone is going to be the, the main part of the Europe for the next steps of integration, deepening integration. So uh, we are speaking about it, but the Czechs are very... Uh, under the, under the pessimism of spreading by former President Václav Klaus, and uh, because only together we should support democratic political forces, Czechs and Slovaks, pushing of uh, supporting democratic forces in Poland and Hungary. That is very important. I am uh, I'm going out of my experience when, uh, when Mečiar government was in Slovakia. So who was helping us a lot? Polish people, Czechs, democratic organizations, and the Hungarians too. So we have to deal with it. Who will deal with it? The neighbors should do it. Um, immediately. So uh, uh, that was the time I remember when uh, Madeleine Orbeit have said that Slovakia is the black hole of Europe. So we have to be aware that the Central Europe with Poland and uh, Hungary uh, should never be again the black hole as a, as a whole region. Uh, uh, now I am, for, for day, some days ago, I returned from a meeting of the decisive political forces in the Baltic states. Um, and uh, some invited guests, uh, especially from Germany in Vilnius. 
uh, in the whole of uh, Lithuanian parliament, the, the hall was filled with the call for us to cooperate, uh, for not to put our hands in the lap, uh, not to lament all the time like spoiled children. Uh, representatives of uh, some parties from Germany, especially from AfD, um, were immensely surprised of, um, from the energy in which the individual representatives of the Baltic states uh, were speaking with us. And, uh, and they told us that, that they are really ready for, for changes uh, that are coming and uh, will solve the problems on the march with the support of the population of the Baltic states. Uh, we have to be aware that we still don't have support of our population for all these changes. If we are speaking about the enlargement of, uh, of uh, European Union, please, are we aware that many of our people think that the EU is only a bundle of money? And we, we, if we will be a net of payer, how will the political uh, landscape will change in our countries? So these are uh, questions we have to speak about it and have to speak openly. So uh, I think that uh, I am taking with me now a little energy from the Baltic states here in this ministerium. Thank you. On this uh, uplifting note, let me turn to Dr. Chichotsky. Uh, upon entering the EU, the Visegrad four prime ministers in that renewed declaration declared that they will work together towards future enlargements of the EU, to shape EU policies in the neighborhood, and they identified common foreign security policy as a particularly promising area for cooperation. Um, we are witnessing what's happening with these three elements today. Uh, we had a long discussion touching upon these issues also before. Um, my more broader question would be whether this the current differences on some of these issues, and in particular when it comes to Hungarian response to the Russian invasion to Ukraine, uh, of Ukraine, are these differences a cause for or a symptom of the differences between the countries? Thank you very much for this. Um no question at the beginning. I, 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 I think um, um, there were always divergences uh, between uh, uh, between um, uh, V4 uh, states, but um, um, it was uh, not my intention to talk about V4. Uh, because, as uh, Professor Balash said at the very beginning, um, V4 is a tool of the regional cooperation, the assessment of this tool is uh, um, due to the expectations we, uh, we, we formulate, um, and the expectations are rooted in the, very often in the everyday uh, uh, politics. What I want to talk is rather about the Central Europe as a, as a political um, issue in the European Union, and um, I would like to start with um, with uh, with uh, with, uh, uh, with the declaration of the of the strong optimism, uh, because uh, especially recently, I think uh, we complained so much about uh, European integration and uh, European Union, and especially we complain. Uh, so often about uh, uh, Central uh, Europe. There are, of course, good reasons for uh, 
uh, complaining or for being um, uh, worried um, suddenly. But uh, I, I think um, it is important to remember exactly, you, you mentioned about the f frictions, differences. These differences started uh, between the uh, member states um, in this region. Uh, this difference started uh, even in the uh, pre-accession period, uh, in the negotiations. And of course, uh, after that, uh, we saw uh, uh, many differences uh, uh, rising. But uh, uh, from the very beginning also, I think, it was clear that um, this region of Central Europe is a part of a greater, uh, wider, uh, problem, uh, problem of the future of, uh, of, of the European project and of the European uh, integration. And uh, it, is, it, is, it is enough just to recall the circumstances of the enlargement 2004. Uh, this was uh, a very grave post-Nice constitutional crisis in the European uh, Union, and there was a, a very severe uh, a transatlantic crisis uh, 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 as well. And, and, and of course that Central Europe was uh, uh, the part of uh, both uh, uh, crises uh, at the very beginning, uh, 2000, uh, 2004. Uh, but looking, I think, from the perspective of 20 years, because it is nearly 20 years, nearly two decades, I wonder, uh, by the way, uh, whether it is not t a time, a good time to think how to rename these members, because uh, the notion new uh, member states or uh, uh, newcomers uh, uh, seems to be um, really uh, f f fitting to, 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 to reality. Uh, this is uh, uh, the perspective of near uh, two uh, decades already. So uh, looking from this uh, long perspective of near two decades, I, 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 uh, I would like to, to state uh, uh, my, my optimistic assessment. Uh, uh, this process of the reunification of, of Europe uh, is a great achievement. Is a great achievement and in my opinion even embracing all problems we have, crises, differences, um, disputes um, between uh, the states of, 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 of Central Europe, but also between some states and, and, and old member states and uh, European institutions, uh, despite all problems with uh, um, with, uh, with migration crisis, uh, rule of law crisis, uh, um, um, co corruption uh, co crises uh, we, we, we are witnessing in some of the, of, of the, of, of the countries. I, I think what we have to admit at first is that this is a real, this reunification of, of Europe is a, a great... Uh, achievement of the last uh, two uh, decades. And no one can say today that this reunification uh, was not beneficial for the European Union and for Central Euro uh, Europe and for the old member states. Now, um, looking into future, because this was my uh, major uh, intention to talk about uh, Central Europe uh, as a political issue in the European uh, Union, especially now because of the war, which in my opinion changed a lot uh, when it comes to the situation of the European Union and especially when it comes to the situation of, of Central European uh, European countries. Uh, uh, this war 
um, uh, means, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, a significant, uh, significant shift. And uh, I would just only list five very briefly. Uh, don't be uh, scared. Uh, f five, five, uh, uh, five um, um, uh, factors uh, framing the new situation of Central Europe and the EU. The first one is a perspective which is caused by the question of a political credibility of designers of the EU security and foreign policy since 2000. 14, and the impact of this perspective on the whole discussion about the future of uh, European Union as a, as, a, as a geopolitical actor, uh, um, um, security, uh, autonomy of the European uh, Union, and so on and so forth. I think this perspective, because the perspective, because of these questions about the political credibility of the designers of the security policy of the European Union after 2014, has changed uh, a little bit of uh, in, 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 in the inner perspective uh, in the European Union, and especially here in Central Europe, in my opinion. The second factor uh, already mentioned is the NATO enlargement, Sweden and Finland. I know this is about the NATO enlargement. Uh, 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 Sweden and Finland are in the European Union. However, again, the new situation of the whole Baltic Sea region will change the, 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 the balance, uh, the ge ge geopolitical political and geographical balance within the European Union. Uh, uh, especially when it comes uh, uh, to the uh, threat perception and, and, and security and foreign, uh, foreign policy. And this will impact uh, Central Europe and th this will also impact uh, the old uh, uh, member states uh, 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 as well. The third uh, uh, factor is, of course, uh, Ukraine and the growing uh, weight of, of, of Ukraine when it comes to the European, uh, European uh, affairs, and especially when it comes uh, uh, to the uh, uh, central, uh, central Europe. Uh, and this is, this, the, it, it, it can't be just only confined to the endless debate about the uh, Ukrainian uh, membership in the European Union, because um, we will uh, uh, conduct this discussion probably for 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 a uh, long time. I, I, I suppose I, I, I am afraid. What we what we have to talk now, and I think uh, Central U Europe should be here a uh, very uh, active uh, um, part of, of, of the game, is what we can do now, how we can bring Ukraine now closer to the European Union, how we can make uh, uh, Ukraine visible in the European Union, in the European institutions. Maybe we can think uh, already about, uh, I don't know, the status of the observer, uh, in the European Parliament, in the Commission for, uh, for, for in the Committee for Regions, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in other uh, uh, European agencies as, uh, as, as, as well. The fourth is a Black Sea region, which, which again will frame differently the situation of Central Europe. It includes Romania, Bulgaria, uh, uh, Moldau, uh, uh, but uh, who remember here in this room the Black Sea Synergy, a very ambitious project of the European Union uh, many years uh, ago. Maybe it is a time to come back to this kind of thinking. I, I think European Union and especially Central and be especially Central Europe, and especially because of Central Europe, can not be absent in the Black Sea region. And finally, 
in inner frictions between uh, uh, Central European uh, countries. You, you, you have mentioned this, uh, this, uh, this, this, this issues. Of course, we will face the problem how to uh, keep the cooperation in the region together, because um, especially uh, the Hungarian case shows that um, we can witness uh, in the near future uh, a grave problems, how to, how to, how to keep the, the common position of the region and the common position of the European Union vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, for example, sanction policy or uh, the Eastern policy of the European uh, Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start with uh, Professor Balash. You said that the V4 is um, under-institutionalized, and that gave me the feeling that you would like to see it more institutionalized. Um, yet we do see, or we have seen in the course of the last 18 years, uh, quite a number of successes when it comes to cooperation between the V4 uh, in relation to EU's policies. At the same time, we see now quite some differences, also with regard to the future of Europe. Um, my question to you would be, and I'm also linking this to the previous statement by the Director for Policy, who said that you know, there are other uses of V4. Uh, where are these other uses? Where do you see still really good cooperation, which can be served as the basis or a new basis for, for perhaps a spillover into those issues that have been mentioned where we should cooperate or there should be more cooperation. Thank you for the question. I think uh, the, uh, the V4 could do uh, a lot more, a lot more. There were times when, uh, for instance, in the Hungarian Foreign Service, I asked all the embassies uh, to, to hold regular meetings with the V4 ambassadors all over the world, everywhere. Uh, and uh, there were several initiatives of that time. Or let me refer to the very interesting points of uh, uh, Mrs. Vasharyova. Uh, a lot could be done in order uh, you know, to uh, approach each other's conception on, on common history. We could uh, work a lot. Uh, this is not a general problem because uh, tensions are uh, uh, always located between neighbors, direct neighbors. For instance, there's a lot of positive elements between the Hungarian and Polish history, uh, mostly positive. The tensions are with the Slovak history because we have a common a past and, and it's very difficult to, to, to write common history books. At the same time, we have a very strong uh, common identity, uh, especially from, um, from Soviet uh, times. Uh, the, uh, the upheavals in our countries, only the V4 countries uh, stood up against the Soviet rule before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, 1956, upheavals in Poland and Hungary. Uh, 1968, uh, the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, and uh, the systemic change itself with three wonderful presidents, uh, Valenza, uh, Havel, and Gönc, uh, uh, very similar terms. So uh, V4 has a very strong basis, and we could build on that, but we need a moment when the four governments converge and agree. And for the time being, that condition is not given. So we should wait for better times when there will be uh, open governments for cooperation, and we should make use of that situation if it comes. And I hope it would come. Thank you. If not the governments, then perhaps one can draw on the civil society, traditionally extremely uh, let's say active, and you have mentioned yourself this. Mrs. Vasharyova, you referred to uh, civil society activism, if I may say, uh, and then you also mentioned that what needs to be done is work on the perception of the EU in the countries. That is the perception between the citizens. This is not just the governments that are currently in place. Uh, how can, or let's say, 
what can, how can the civil society be supported from the point of view of the, let's say, EU's initiatives or actions, and also maybe in terms of the future of EU-level democracy? Of, uh, it's um, the NGO sector or civil society sector is, uh, for example, in Slovakia, very strong. Of course, uh, the, the founder of our civil society is Mr. Mechiar, yeah, <laughs> and our fight against, against uh, his regime. But anyway, uh, and these uh, all um, NGOs have a very close contact to the NGOs in, uh, in the Czech Republic or Poland, and especially, for example, in Hungary. So, uh, and we have a tool as I've mentioned, International Visegrad Fund. Um, um, I, was, uh, I was witnessing, I was uh, at the very beginning of this fund, and uh, they are the, you, you, you can apply, you are able to apply uh, big grants or small grants uh, going through the frontiers and so on and so on. So, uh, if you don't have... Uh, governmental forces, they are able to cooperate, so there is a, there is a civil society. They are able to cooperate. Um, as I've mentioned, uh, we have to be aware that the Central Europe is not a very, very quiet place. And we've never been before at least in these 100 years, when I'm not speaking about the division of Poland, 1772, if I am correct, yes? So, of, uh, we have to be aware of it, because if we are, we, we are thinking about us as a white pigeons, we are not, really not. And we are also a little bit threat for the of uh, you and the next enlargement. And it, it's uh, fantastic now uh, uh, when we see uh, our people to be solidar with Ukraines so much, but how long it could be taken the time, yes? So we have to be very careful, very careful. Of, uh, so, uh, uh, I think that the, the basic aim today of the Central Europe is to say clearly and loudly nothing could be done in Europe, in, in, uh, in architecture of Europe, without Ukraine. Not to speak about Ukraine without Ukraines. This must be such a such a loud sentence, we have to repeat it daily. Because if we are going through the letter of the German intellectuals or the American intellectuals, you see how they are ready to, to, to handle with the Central Europe. Oh, they, have, they are making problems in the Ukraine, so we have to solve it. Like the Minsk protocols. What was the men's protocol? Something about Ukraine without Ukraine. So this is, uh, I think, uh, the very important tools. Uh, what a pity, uh, 30 years younger, I was more probably optimistic, and I, I thought that uh, before these 650 million people could be, now, now, please, 65 million people of, uh, could be a new engine in the European Union. A new, really new engine. Pro-European, pro-cooperation, pro-solidarity and everything. And we are not. What a pity. And then we have Austria as another, our neighbor where the Russians are sitting very deeply and we are not able to cooperate really deeply with the Austrians. Why? And this is my problem as a former ambassador 
to Vienna. So uh, there are many, many problems, but I am I'm sure that we are only to solve or to try to solve these problems only uh, when, uh, when we will have representatives in our states, they want to cooperate. And uh, so now it's a problem, a little bit, really a problem. Uh, I am very sorry that we don't have a, a really cooperative uh, Austrians because the Austrians uh, the companies are very much deep in uh, Slovakia and the Czech Republic and so, and uh, we are trying to so save, for example, the, uh, the bank, Austrian bank, the Erste, uh, and we succeeded. But uh, anyway, uh, Uh, they, there's, yes, of course, we have to wait for some, some uh, uh, election processes. But uh, uh, we, we don't have time only to, to, to wait for the, another elections. Uh, but the intellectuals of the Central Europe must write another letter. I think so. A letter who will oppose the letters of the German intellectuals and American intellectuals. And uh, this is not only about Ukraine, as, I've, as I told you, but uh, it's also about the future of the whole Central Europe. Uh, not speaking about the Balkan, we have a big responsibility what's, what's, what's going to uh, in, in the Balkan. Uh, are we ready to to integrate uh, Bosnia. This is our problem, European problem, and the problem of the Central Europe. And we are Slovaks, uh, we are very close to, we are also, uh, with the language, very close to to, uh, to Balkan region because we understand you all. So anyway, uh, please uh, be more active, I would say more, more active, because we are now deeply in our own problems. Who will be the Czech president? Who will be there? Who will be there? But we don't have time. They are, and this is the lesson I've learned in these 30 years, the windows of opportunity to solve something are open, but only a very short time. Thank you very much. Uh, my last question, the last question before opening the floor, and with this, this is my invitation for you to signal so that I start the list. Uh, Dr. Cichotsky, I'm trying to establish the basis for Central European cooperation um, and for your optimism. And uh, you mentioned uh, regions or world beyond the EU, and Professor Balas also mentioned the initiative he had on for the ambassadors around the world to cooperate. Um, so my last question would be, um, are there uh, policies or issues um, beyond the EU where the Visegrad force cooperate, where they are champions of something that could be the base for to spill over into other areas? Uh, perhaps the common view of Black Sea region or the view of human rights, over human rights, or perhaps other policies as a base for future cooperation? Um, I think if you, if you need such an, an example, I think uh, what you can observe in, in, in last uh, months uh, um, uh, toward uh, Ukraine uh, is a is a very good example of, uh, of, of cooperating. Of course, uh, <laughs> with one exception, we, we know very, uh, very well. But generally speaking, I think that this uh, serves as a, as a very good example of ability of, uh, of, of cooperating and, and mobilizing 
uh, it, it itself of, uh, of countries of the region and of the countries which are beyond of this region because this is uh, also related to Baltic states, for example. Uh, so I think uh, um, if you need an, an example of such an uh, ability, I, 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 I would mention, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, immediately uh, this uh, newest, uh, newest example. Um, That you are. <laughs> no, for, for more good examples to finish on a very positive note and open the floor. Be, be, because you know, the question is what we are talking about, and that was exactly what I said at the beginning. If we are talking about V4, really, I, I, I believe in V4 as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a platform for the regional cooperation when it comes to, for example, infrastructure or when it comes to the uh, ch changing uh, inequalities between the region and other parts of the European uh, uh, Union. As a certain regional presence, political presence, when it comes to the decision-making process in the Council, however, without the expectation that this will mean that uh, this region will uh, uh, um, united uh, uh, um, uh, take part uh, as v uh, four uh, in all kind of the decisions in the council. This is not, uh, I think, the the, the 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 objective of of this kind of uh, of, of of cooperation. Uh, so, uh, talking about v v four, we are talking about a very specific, uh, in my understanding, at, at, at least, uh, format, uh, and 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 that is why I don't tend to extend the, the the expectations. However, if we are talking about central uh, Europe as a political issue in the European Union, this is uh, something much beyond this format. Geographic, and of course, uh, 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 this is also something which is deeply rooted in all this historical context uh, uh, has been uh, mentioned in this discussion. Okay, thank you very much. I have a list here. So we start with Jab de Zwan and then Tomasz Weiss, if I'm not mistaken, and back there, Bostian Udovic. Let's take three first. Thank you very much. Jaap de Zwaan, former director of Klingendal and a former secretary general of TEPTA. Very honored to be here again. I must say I'm a little bit disappointed about the presentations made so far. They, they give an give impression about, yes, we have achieved something, but now we are looking for a new mission. I'm a representative of one of the Benelux countries, so we are very proud that when the European defense community failed, when the, the, the European political community failed in the 60s, at least the Benelux countries were able to give a new stimulus by creating a European economic community. Very proud on that. I must say, these days, the Benelux countries do still cooperate. People do know each other, but they share, of course, similar objectives. They do not agree on all kinds of issues, and, but they at least are in agreement with regard to the objective where we have to go through. And let's see how this will further develop when we are entering discussions about the, the conference on the future and the enlargement file. Now it's exactly the enlargement file where I want to make an appeal to you to be perhaps a little bit more constructive, because we are talking a lot about history. 30 years ago, you were looking for peace, stability. Well, of course, safeguarded by the European Union, NATO framework, what have you, standards of living, etc. And look what you have achieved. And I think in this new period of time, what is now on the agenda of this conference today and tomorrow, it's about the conference for the future, certainly, connected to security. And I think you could play a 
very positive, constructive role when it's just a file regarding Ukraine, because at least with regard to the future of the relationship EU-Ukraine, I think you share a common objective, which is important. And from there on, I think there are other issues which ask for our attention. Of course, the Western Balkans is still there, waiting, waiting, waiting. Perhaps we can discuss this tomorrow more in length. There is the Moldova, the Georgian issue. Is that not something which could give rise to an inspiration for a new mission of the Visegrad 4? Because in the end, we might also argue that well, we don't need the, four, four, the V4 anymore. But it could be a pity. You have achieved quite a lot. And let's hope that you find some inspiration in what you have achieved commonly by stimulating others to come closer to the European Union. A bit provocative, do we need the V4? <laughs> I'll take that from, as, a, as a main point. Uh, Tomasz. Thank you very much, Tomasz Weiss, Charles University. <clears throat> I think my two very short questions uh, will follow directly from what has just been said, but from the, from the more skeptical perspective. Uh, well, first, uh, following on uh, the debate from the previous panel, uh, where several of the speakers mentioned the differentiated integration and uh, various models in which Turkey and Ukraine could be attached to the EU. I wonder, so far we have only had two options, out or in. Now, the Visegrad countries seem to be unsure at least some of them, exactly about the objective and how much in they actually want to be. So I wonder what your views are, if there is any sort of differentiated integration uh, officially introduced because of Turkey and Ukraine. Uh, where do you expect your countries to be and to what extent do you expect them to want to be in the core uh, or not, if there is the possibility? Uh, and the second question, Regarding the V4, uh, we did have an extensive debate on the V4 and the future of the V4 in this building just in the other hall a couple of weeks back. And uh, one of the ideas that resonated around the room, I think, was the question to what extent the V4 is actually a substitute for bilateral relations uh, between the countries. And, and some of you mentioned the bilateral relations. And I wonder, you know, are there any Czech-Hungarian bilateral relations? To what extent are there actually Polish-Hungarian bilateral relations that go beyond the V4 cooperation? Uh, I guess Slovakia probably has got bilateral relations with all three. Uh, but don't you think or, or do you read the V4 in a similar way that they actually substitute some substantial choices being made in the bilateral relations among the countries. Thank you. Thank you very much for the word. So I would totally agree with Ambassador Vasharyova with her assessment about the problematic of the Central Europe. And I would like also to open the question on maybe some forums, some arenas in the Central Europe are obsolete. We are debating about the V4. I had an experience coming from the University of Ljubljana um, to speaking with ambassadors in Ljubljana, also ambassadors of the V4, and once I had a lecture of one of the ambassadors of the V4 country, saying, I, 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 I asked her, uh, what, how you are managing the differentiation between the V4 countries regarding certain topics? And she said, frankly, like today, you know, we are speaking about things on which we agree, and we are not opening questions that we disagree. So my question here is <clears throat> about the relevance of the V4, because we are having new formats, like it is C5, uh, I don't know, different countries that are bordering to the Donau River, whatever it is. So the relevance of the V4 representing V4, the Central Europe, is Central Europe wider, is broader, is, I don't know, maybe, should be understood in a narrower sense. And finally, the main question is, what has or what did Central Europe contribute to the European Union? Because we are understanding Central Europe as a single block, but it's not a single block. 
If we are having different prepositions, if we are having different topics, we are having different associations, like V4, C5, whatever it is, so it's not a single block. And after 17 years, Central Europe is an equal member of the European Union. We are still discussing the division between the old member states and the new member states. And the Central European countries are the new member states. So my question is, how long we are going to prolong this status in the European Union? And is the Ukrainian crisis the possibility to enhance the development of the European Union in this topic? Or we are going just to make a sort of leverage and end with what is going to come the next decade? Because after 2004, in 2022, we are still on the same step. We are having the old countries, the new countries, we are having the V4 against, we are having the rules of law, which is for the Eastern countries, the Central European countries. So, you know, we, we can open lots of debates here, but the rule of law is the rule of law. It's for Hungary, it's for Slovenia, it's for France, it's for Benelux countries. It should be the same, but it's not. And this is the key question for me today. We've been here over an hour and the rule of law only came up now. Migration hasn't been said yet. Um, <laughs> now it's getting interesting. Can I invite all the speakers to briefly comment on and choose what you would like to address, uh, including Peter Balas, of course. And then I'll come to the second round because I have more hands up. And to allow us to do that, I will ask you to, as I said, choose and, and respond to the comments uh, as you wish, starting with uh, Peter Balas. Thank you very much. Interesting questions. Um, uh, anyhow, the V4 is an important geopolitical unit within uh, the EU. It's a block. And uh, there are uh, very important common interests uh, in the field of, of transport, energy, environment. So we are contiguous countries forming one, uh, one block uh, uh, next to Germany and the now neighboring with Ukraine on the other side. Uh, let's not forget that um, uh, the V4 is an interesting uh, phenomenon within the EU because usually smaller blocks have a greater cohesion uh, within a larger uh, organization like the Benelux countries or the Nordic countries. And this is not the case with the V4. The V4 is interestingly a loser uh, uh, organization, a loser structure than the EU. In the EU, there are much more obligations, institutional, legal uh, conditions than within the V4. And the reason is that in the early 90s, there were uh, fears on behalf of all the participants uh, of the V4, let's not overdo it because there were some voices in the EU, then you have your grouping for you, let's not uh, uh, speed up your EU accession. Try integration between and among yourself first. So uh, politicians uh, did not like too much uh, the V4, because uh, some people uh, thought, not without any reason, that it could be a, a substitute to EU membership. And later on, it, it hasn't been that. Uh, now, um, the differentiated integration is a, 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 an evergreen story within the EU. Uh, in reality, we have already some kind of a differentiated inter integration. Look at the Eurozone. Uh, this is a two-level uh, structure. Look at the Schengen. Uh, this is again. And uh, we have the legal basis in the Lisbon Treaty for uh, hardcore action as well. Uh, the idea what uh, President Macron uh, has launched recently to form a, a greater community where Ukraine could find its place and many other countries, even, even the United Kingdom, uh, it's uh, not a bad idea, uh, and uh, we could um, uh, put it on the basis of some shared fundamental values of Europe. Um, uh, as, as far as the, the V4 as a substitute for bilateral relations is concerned, so uh, let me say you as an old diplomat that nothing is replacing uh, the atmosphere. Uh, of bilateral re relations. 
uh, there is a special face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, uh, exchange of views, uh, uh, talking with each other. And yes, there are, and there have been, and there should be Hungarian-Slovak uh, uh, relations, which are not interchangeable with any other relationship. And in the same way, Hungarian Czech and Hungarian Polish and so on. B4 is another structure uh, which is framing a larger uh, unit. Then again, uh, uh, it has come up several times that uh, why not to enlarge V4? But every time we came back uh, to the, um, uh, uh, the conviction that this is a four-wheel drive car, let's not add any more because it would change the character. Uh, we have shared the view that V4 plus is a good formula. So V4 plus uh, inviting countries and, and uh, uh, sharing um, views. And uh, of course, I could uh, speak a lot, but I will not, uh, about uh, how uh, the case of Ukraine is enhancing uh, the development. It has been a wake up call and it is stimulating action and, and forging unity with very few exceptions. Unfortunately, my country is one of them. Thank you very much. I've been given five extra minutes, so we need to be brief. Ambassador Vasharyova. Enlargement. Of, uh, I was witnessing many, many, of, uh, many, many projects how to enlarge the V4 but there were so many other uh, and, uh, enlarged uh, initiatives uh, about the Central Europe, uh, for example, from, from uh, uh, Italy and so on. So uh, we thought that uh, these four countries have something common uh, and uh, we, have to, we have to at least cooperate on some extent. So... Um, but I don't know if we are not able to cooperate, really cooperate, because uh, when we are speaking about the energy policy, there was a huge project to have a common refinery. Yes? Do you remember? Now we don't have anything. Yes, we have, a, we don't, we Slovaks, we now, we don't have any refinery because the, the biggest refinery of Central Europe is uh, the, in, the, in the hands of, uh, of Magyars, so mall. Of, uh, so we are speaking about the prices of uh, oil, but pr practically <laughs> we don't have our a refinery. So uh, now is a project uh, of the Czech refinery being, being bought by by probably of a Polish refinery and so on, but we were not able to make our common energy policy. So uh, I don't know if we are not, uh, I don't know, from the, from the birth, we are not able to cooperate and uh, we don't have such a strong strategic of a way of thinking, uh, but uh, this is a true. Uh, what, it's uh, it's so uh, you are you are speaking about why we are not speaking about the future, but we have to solve nowadays problems. <laughs> nowadays problems, and uh, probably we are not uh, not uh, not strong enough or uh, long sighted enough uh, to to speak about the future, about the future, um, uh, because. Uh, uh, we have to we have to think a little bit about history. For example, if you see the whole Magyar uh, Orsak, because they have they are not any more republic, so Magyar <laughs> Orsak being being uh, settled by by maps where Slovakia doesn't exist. So uh, we have to be aware of it. Yes, or about the project uh, of uh, um, uh, Mr. Pilsudski, Intermaria. Yes, what was that? 
of uh, what was the, 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 the aim of this project. So we have to be very careful, uh, not only because of us, but because of uh, European Union and our position in the European Union. Um, well, f f first, f first of all, I, 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 I of course, I, I, I take your p p point that we have to show objectives um, uh, more clearly. Although I am not sure whether um, the example of Benelux states is here in any uh, way supportive, because I think, um, I have the feeling we are talking here about two different uh, uh, logics of regional uh, co cooperation. Um, but, 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 but I agree, we, we, we have to show clearly the objectives and security is um, certainly one of the most, uh, most, uh, most important. When it comes to the core um, integration, no, I don't, um, I'm not a fan of this idea uh, and no one in Poland is. Um, uh, flexible integration, yes, but not, of course, in the terms of any kind of the a la carte. Uh, it is rather uh, uh, that we can uh, uh, go faster or slower, but we have to meet somewhere uh, to, 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 to together, but not the core Europe. I think this is a dream of those who never accepted what has happened uh, in, 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 in Europe uh, as the outcome of the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, and uh, whether uh, this regional cooperation or V4 is a replacement of the bilateral relations, I think this is a good uh, intuition, I, 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 I think, but not replacement. It makes the relations uh, more uh, feasible. Uh, why? Because, you know, if you look at this region, you, you have complained about that we have talked so much about history. But unfortunately, history is a part of, uh, of, of, of this region. And, and also asymmetry is a part of this region. This region was uh, very long a place of, uh, of a struggle and competition of different powers. And, 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 and this has framed um, uh, strategic culture uh, uh, of all these countries of, 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 of the region. Additionally, Poland is always too big for uh, Czechs. Or uh, for uh, yeah. you know we, we can't we simply we can't uh, make um, uh, directly our bilateral relations uh, because um, we we were not accepted by our our partners in that form. So I think that this cooperation V4 is um, uh, it gives. Uh, uh, an uh, important, uh, important uh, uh, tool for, uh, for, for, for uh, realizing uh, uh, relations in, in, in the region because of these different uh, historical experiences and because of these asymmetries we have in, 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 in the region. So not replacement, but, but, uh, uh, but a way to, to, to make these relations uh, possible and, and more effective. What that means for the future of Europe, we'll continue discussions tomorrow in the tomorrow session, including the question that Petr Balas posed and it remained in the air, namely why Hungary and Slovakia did not join that letter and why Poland is the only, may I call it, big country did join the letter of the 9th of May. But that's a discussion for tomorrow. Left for today is for me just to thank our three panelists and apologies to Peter Balas, who is somewhere lingering in the virtual world. Oh no, you're back. <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> for your interventions, uh, for your insights, and uh, also for, for, your, for, for the diversity of your views. And thank you, the audience, and everybody who made comments and questions for enriching this debate. With this, the day ends. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you.